Well, Stephen, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview. I think we're going to have no disagreement at all about the fact of evolution. Absolutely fact, not. Let's say in chorus, evolution, evolution is, is a fact. fact. Full right. stop. Good. Okay. Now we can get on to the areas of possible disagreements. What about... Uh, natural selection. I presume, again, there's no disagreement that natural selection is important, but how important? Well, that's the crucial issue, and I think where I differ from you, and where I would say I was more of a Darwinist than you, is that Darwin was always a pluralist, and that is, he insisted that natural selection was one crucial mechanism of evolutionary change, but it wasn't the only one. Yes. Uh, as Darwin said, he put that in a prominent place at the end of the first chapter. On the grounds that he'd been much misunderstood. Absolutely, which, of course, he has been. Yes. Um, and I would agree with that, uh, and I'm a pluralist in the sense that I believe that uh, neutralism is very important, for example, that, that a great deal of evolutionary change yes. at the molecular level is neutral. However, I think the one thing that I, I would insist, and I, I kind of want you to agree with this, is that uh, whatever else your pluralism may admit, it, it can't explain adaptation. Only natural selection can explain the adaptive fit of organisms to environment. Well, that's true in a sense, except it's also the case that organisms choose their own environment, so the environment okay. also becomes adapted to the organism. Um, and the other issues which float around in that is a good deal of um, change that you see in organisms could be either what um, Steve Gould and Dick Lewontin called all those years ago spandrels, that is their accidental consequences of other adaptive changes. The other issue we have to look at, and again following Steve Gould, I'd use the word exaptations, that is changes that have taken place in an organism for one function, which then become um, involved and utilised in other functions. The classical example, as you know, is feathers, which were originally, um, we believe, thermoregulatory devices to keep an animal regulated in its temperature, but then became um, functional in the case of flying as well. So that's what Gould called an exaptation. Yeah. Yeah, we have no disagreement about that either. I mean, clearly you need exaptation or pre-adaptation, as it used to be called, uh, to explain how so many things arose. Things didn't arise always for the, for the purpose in which we Indeed now not. see them. Yeah. And, uh, and for, the, for the other point about spandrels, again, I would agree that many, many things are byproducts of something else. And so when you see something in an animal and say, what's the adaptive function of that? It may be the wrong question. It's not got an adaptive function in that sense. What we're seeing is a byproduct of something else. So I think we have no disagreement about that. Um, I've heard the, the name ultra-Darwinist applied to me. It's not a, a, a name I relish. I, I think you probably prefer the word rather more than I do. Um, what, what does it I mean? Well I, well, I have used it, actually. Yes. So uh, what does it mean to you? Well, what it means, um, and this, I think, will get to the, 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 the core of differences between us, is the, um, your view, um, at least the view with which you're most closely associated, is, that the, is to be able to divide um, organisms into pass essentially passive vehicles, phenotypes, um, and replicators, the gene and then to insist that the le level at which selection takes place, the, the key level, so far as natural selection is concerned, is the level of the G. Now that's what I would call, and other people would call, ultra-Darwinism. I'd want to argue, not merely as we've actually agreed, that um, adaptation isn't the only name in the game, there are structural constraints and all sorts of other things that are going on, but also the levels at which selection works are not just gene, but they're gene, cell, genome, organism, populations of organisms. Selection working at all of those levels, but also, and I think this is fundamental, um, that um, it's not, organisms develop you cannot understand evolutionary change without understanding developmental change. So what has to change is an entire developmental system, not just a particular feature of an organism. Yeah. And that's a different perspective on the way that change occurs. And once again, I think there really isn't any disagreement, or such as it appears to be, is, is semantic. Um, when I'm you... not sure it's just semantic, actually, <laughs> Richard. Um, it's partly your fault. And it's your fault because you're such a bloody good writer and you actually have this spectacular gift for metaphor, which um, a lot of us envy. But nonetheless, the, the metaphor of the selfish gene, which is yours, I think, above all, is a metaphor which carries such weight with it that it actually sort of ignores the subtleties and the much more yeah. important areas L of the agreement. Let me come back to that, because I think there is a respect in which the metaphor of the selfish, metaphor of the selfish gene has been uh, misleading. But on the particular matter of the level at which selection acts, 
I think it is semantic in the following sense. I accept absolutely that natural selection works at the vehicle level. I mean, yeah. you used my own word, at the vehicle level, where the ve vehicle is normally the organism, but might be some other level in the hierarchy of life. But there is one thing, and only one thing, which singles genes out as unique, and that is that they're the things that go on to the next generation. Well, they're not. I mean, this is again, I mean, here I, start, here I insist, as, a, as, as, as someone as a biochemist, that this is exactly what genes do not do. Um, the argument that genes are self-replicating, that these lengths of DNA can copy themselves, is not true. They can only copy them, so they can only be copied by the orchestra of the cell working of course, with its enzymes, yeah. working with its proteins yeah. and so on. So the idea that this mythical unit, unit, the gene, goes on from generation to generation isn't the case. What goes on is a, is a metabolic sequence in which DNA is copied as a result of complicated enzymic processes. And those copies, um, changed in a variety of ways, then go on to the next... And generation. actually there's even less goes on. I mean, it's, it's, it's not even a metabolic sequence, it's just a code. Uh, it, well, again, the, the emphasis on the code actually sort of puts primacy on a molecule, whereas I would put primacy on the whole orchestra of the cell in which the molecule yes, works. See, I mean, yeah. DNA is actually a very, very boring molecule, except that's why it's inert. That's why you can actually sort of... That's why it's so good at what it does. It's good at what it does, yes. and it's why you can extract it unchanged from amber, and why Jurassic Park might be possible. Yeah. But actually, sort of, I would want to insist on dynamism. Yes. Once you've got dynamism yeah. there, this little inert molecule that actually has to be has to, has to be copied by complex processes is 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 part of what we have to understand. So we have to understand cellular metabolism and the whole um, orchestra of the cell, rather than the individual molecule. Stephen, you accuse me of being good with words. I mean, you're, you're, you're being seduced by your own rhetoric now. Well, I, I don't dispute for a moment <laughs> that there's, it is all terribly complicated yeah. and, and things like that. But there is one thing that goes through through all this dynamic biochemistry and copying machinery, and that is the code. And that's the only point I'm making, that it, the code goes on. Of course it needs all that metabolic machinery in order to do it, but the code goes on, and that's what we need for natural selection. That's the only point, and that's what singles the gene out, the gene in the sense of the code. I agree that genes in practice are a whole lot of other stuff as well, but it's the, it's the code that goes on, it's the differential versions of the code, mutated versions of the code, which differentially survive in natural selection, and it's the vehicle by which they survive, which we see and, and, and study. But finally, the unit of natural selection, in that sense, is the code. Yes, but I think that that sense actually sort of ignores the subtlety and the richness of the biology itself. And it does so for the very good reason that, as we now know, to take the human genome, for example, you've got 25,000, quotes genes, perhaps 23,000 genes. You've got at least 100,000 different proteins. You've got 100 trillion different cells in the body. The combinatorial explosion that's involved in that developmental process means that genes are not codes in the sense in which they are, have been conventionally understood. It is the cell which actually, if you like, selects which bit of the DNA to turn on, which bit of the DNA to fabricate, to shuffle around in order to synthesize particular proteins. And so, generation by generation, what changes is not just, as it were, this particular piece of DNA and this particular substituted base within it, but the entire regulatory processes within the cell which make that pattern of selections. And it's that richness, I think, which is lost by your metaphor of the vehicle, um, which implies it's simply passive. You know, it's driven by this master yes, molecule. Yes, I, I, I wouldn't wish it to be passive ever. I certainly wouldn't wish that, and I accept all the complexity of it. But when you ask what is it that changes in frequency, it is it is alleles in gene pools that changes in frequency. How they do it, all the, all the, the, the complexity of by the means by which they do it, I think that's part of the phenotype. And, it's, and the phenotype is immensely complicated, no, no question about that. It is immensely complicated, but then the, the, even the distinction between genotype and phenotype is a sort of metaphysical distinction. After all, if you like, a DNA molecule is the phenotype of the gene. No, I don't yeah. think so. Well, yeah. And, All right, let's, that, let's let that pass. And, and that is, I think that we are trapped in a way of thinking about genes which comes out of uh, um, Mendelian history and the rediscovery of, of, of Mendel back at the beginning of the last century, beginning of the 20th century, which actually did make this distinction between genes 
phenotype, genotype, phenotype, and so on, as if you could divide an organism up in this sort of way. And what I want to come back to always, and, and, this, and, you know, and I don't think this is a mere semantic distinction, is the difference between understanding an organism as, 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 as dynamic, as constantly sort of engaged in changing its own internal structure and in changing its relationship with its environment and modifying its environment, as you yourself quite nicely say when you talk about the dam as part of the beaver's phenotype, yeah. but that's an environment which is changed in a whole variety of ways as a result of the functions of lots of organisms. And whilst you actually sort of insist on the primacy of one particular molecule, you actually ignore that complexity either at the life of the individual organism or the changing life of organisms generation by generation, which is what evolutionary change is about. Mm. Well, I think we're not going to agree on a form of words. I actually don't think we disagree as much as... as no, as, I've, <laughs> I've always said that on, yeah. most, on, on the fundamental issues, that we yeah. started with our chorus at the beginning about yes. evolution as a fact, about the importance, but the li relatively limited importance of natural selection and the pluralism of Darwinism, then if we agree about that, then I think a good deal of the ways in which, in a sense, you have been misinterpreted or you've allowed yourself to be misinterpreted yeah. would, 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 would disappear. Yeah. But I do think the misinterpretation is partly your own fault. Okay. Well, let, let me come on to how, what you said when you introduced that idea, which was the idea of the selfish gene yeah. itself. And I think there's another way in which that's been misinterpreted, which is that the word selfish is a sort of down word. Yeah. And, um, I'm now realizing that it might have been better if instead of calling my first book The Selfish Gene, I'd called it The Altruistic Organism. Um, because in a way, yeah. the whole point about The Selfish Gene is to explain the altruistic yeah. organism. And, and because it's, it's kind of counterintuitive how you can get an altruistic organism out of, out of Darwinian selection. And The Selfish Gene is, is what does it. Uh, so w would you agree that that would have been a better title? Maybe? Well, I mean, you're always very good at titles, so why not? Mm. But actually, sort of, let's look at that again, the issue of The Selfish Gene the individual gene, because genes, however you, you, you look at them, are as nothing except in the context of a genome. And that is that, um, if you called it the selfish genome, it might have been better. No, no, that would be wrong. That would, that would be and, wrong. That, and that's because change, changes in an individual gene, a mutation in a base pair, which is going to affect an individual gene, which is how we define mutation and, and gene changes, doesn't mean anything except in the context of the, of, of the genome. I mean, let me give you an, an example, okay, and why I say you have to look at evolution in terms of developmental systems. Take a mutation in a gene, it, it might be one of your own examples earlier on, which helps antelopes run faster, therefore they're likely to escape the, um, the, the, the lions which are pursuing them. On the other hand, any single mutation in a gene which makes an antelope run faster has got to take into account that this is going to affect all the other genes which are in the system, the whole developmental pattern, the, um, the, 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 the antelope in the womb, therefore, the economy of the relationship between the mutant antelope and its mother, the relationship between that antelope and the herd in which it is. And so one gene in isolation or one mutation in isolation cannot be understood except in the context of the activity of the whole and that's I think yeah. that's that's I think fundamental to the way that I as a biologist yes. can see these things actually and uh, me too um, the, the way I would put it is that all the other genes in the genome are part of the environment in which each gene has to survive yeah and and that that's that's there's a there's a wonderful image of, of Conrad Waddington I think it was him but maybe I'm, I modified it uh, you, you 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 imagine a, a blanket hanging from the hanging from the yeah. ceiling by thousands of rubber bands and all the rubber bands are crisscrossing and mm -hmm. muddled up together and the shape of the blanket is the is the shape of all the different is governed by the tensions in all these different rubber bands and the, the different rubber yeah. bands at the top are the, are the different genes but they interact with each other all the way down now if you cut any of those rubber back bands anywhere you don't get a simple effect on the blanket you get a, a shift in the entire yeah. Yeah. conformation and the entire balance of the blanket that's the kind of image that i would want to to build out and i think you'd agree with that well that's a much more complicated and a much more interesting image and how what it was very good at images of that from sort as well. from yes. a, a, when you're trying to explain embryology that, yeah. that's right yeah. but if you're trying to explain natural selection if you're trying to explain what happens as something changes in frequency down the generations yeah. you still go back to the single gene nobody denies that the single genes have enormously complicated interactive effects in embryology nevertheless but what i'm saying to you is that a change in a single gene um, 
is meaningless except in the context of, ch of a whole series of adaptive changes. Yeah, embry em embryologically away. meaningless, but not but And not therefore selectively. survival meaningless, and therefore yeah. evolutionarily yes. meaningless. Because yes. if your antelope, yeah. which has its stronger muscles, can't survive, because that puts an extra strain on other yeah. sorts of yeah. things, it ain't going to yeah. be selective. Yeah. Once again, Stephen, we totally agree. I mean, you know, I, I've said all of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, your small print is, is fine. Whenever I read your footnotes, I think, what, what the hell is the disagreement about? Why are people getting so angry with Richard? The people, reason why people get angry with Richard is, 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 is the large print up at the front of no, it. No, it's because um, you incite them, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> but that's, that's, where, that, that, yeah. that's where I think um, Darwinism and its implications are misunderstood. And they're misunderstood particularly when it comes to look at the implications okay. of Darwinian ideas, evolutionary ideas, biological ideas, for understanding the human condition. Okay. Stephen, when push comes to shove, I think you'd call yourself a, a Darwinian, but I get the feeling sometimes that you're a bit reluctant, and perhaps on, on political grounds, on almost emotional grounds. Oh, absolutely not. I mean, um, you cannot understand, as, um, a, a, as Theodor Do Do Theodosius Stobzhansky said all those years ago, nothing in biology makes sense except in the context of evolution. And this was Darwin's great contribution, as is was the theory of natural selection as a key part of the evolutionary mechanisms. So everyone in, uh, every biologist has to be a Darwinian in that sense by definition. But where I would disagree with Dobzhansky is the statement that in order to understand anything in biology, you have to, not just to understand evolution, but you actually have to stand, understand development. And where it comes to the human condition, I think you actually have to understand all sorts of um, history, culture, technology, um, and indeed the ways as humans we actually sort of change our own lives in the most interesting sorts of manners. Okay. Um, do, do you understand why it is that in Soviet Russia there was a kind of hostility to, well, at least Mendelism? Well, there's a long and complicated history about that because, of course, at the, in the 1920s, at the beginning of the, um, the, the period of, of high Marxism in the Soviet Union, there was a great deal of enthusiasm for, certainly for Darwin, and also for Mendel. I mean, the, and some of the key developments that took place in the 1920s and the 1930s, um, of people, like contributors like Vavilov, contributors like Vygotsky and so on, to understanding the implications of Darwinism, I think were tremendously important. Then, of course, came Stalin stamping down on the whole bloody thing and an attack on um, what they saw as the mystical elements within, um, within, within um, what they called Mendel Morganism. Um, and that was a disaster for biology, a disaster for the Soviet Union, and a disaster in a lot of ways for trying to understand the real richness of the Darwinian contribution to our understanding of biology. Do you understand why it was that some really quite distinguished British geneticists sort of went along with, with Lysenko at the time? Well, um, I think that there's only, um, well, there are a few examples of distinguished geneticists who went along with Lysenko, and some of them went along simply out of loyalty to the Communist Party. Um, Desmond Bernal, the crystallographer, um, was very clear about that. He insisted that at this stage the world is divided into two camps, neither you're for the Soviet Union in all its Stalinist form, and, um, or you're against it. Um, other biologists went along with um, the critique of men, what they called Mendel Morganism for a variety of reasons, because they couldn't then understand how it was that um, adaptive change could actually occur in the way that it did. Um, it, again, it comes back to the issue about whether you give primacy to the gene or you give primacy to the organism and its environment. Some very interesting writings by people like Hyman Levy, and even, in fact, Haldane, who um, left the Communist Party over his, uh, over his critique of Lysenko at that point, um, actually sort of try to understand what it was that was going on in this particular very complicated debate. And a debate which was disastrous, of course, for the, um, for, for the development of genetics in the Soviet Union. Uh, the very famous 1948 convention which discussed Lysenko's um, attempt... The situation in biological science indeed, today. Indeed, yeah. indeed, yes. indeed. Which ended with um, Lysenko revealing to the world that Comrade Stalin actually sort of approved of his view of the world, collapse of almost everyone, and um, the real abdication of quite a lot of the geneticists. Yeah. It, was a, it was a horrific situation. And, of course, the destruction of the seed crops in the Soviet Union, the destruction of Vavilov's great... Um, genetic collection was a complete disaster. It reminds me of the sort of religious zeal that one's seen throughout history. It's as though 
uh, science was out of the window, and yeah. the only thing that mattered was, in this case, the party line, which, which in another century would have well, been called the, the, the paper line. In some engine. sense, I think what mattered also was the disastrous state of the Soviet agricultural economy, and the suggestion that here was this guy, Lysenko, who came along and said, sort look, I can, actually, yeah. I can change all this. Yeah. All we have to do is to, sort of, is, is to manipulate our wheat wheat germ in different sorts of ways, and suddenly we will produce new species, or at least ones that will um, crop earlier, so-called vernalization. But that's an episode which I think was disastrous in the history, not just of science in the Soviet Union, not just as an episode in Stalinism and party authoritarianism, but it was actually very bad for the whole way in which genetics had developed in the West as well, because the response to this in the West was to turn your back on this complexity, on the grounds that actually to concede that there was complexity there, to concede that there was complexity there would actually sort of make life a great deal harder. And actually, sort of in the um, in the Cold War period, we almost produced the antithesis of what Lysenko did. Yeah. And I think that was I, th I think that was a horrific episode. But I don't think I mean it's it's a historically significant episode. But I d and maybe in the same way as the whole history of eugenics and the whole history of Nazism colours our view. Um, of um, the checkered history of genetics in the 20th century, which is actually a sort of fairly tough history in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think that that should distract us from trying to understand what are the complexities of what um, a biological, a genetic perspective can op offer us now in terms of understanding the human condition or politics. I suppose somebody might somewhat mischievously suggest that your rhetoric about the complexity of interaction between genes and environment and things was kind of would have gone down rather well with Lysenko. I mean, in some ways, the Mendelist Morganists had a had a rather simpler view. They did have a simple view, and Lysenko had a simple view. I think if one's insisting on complexity, and one's consisting on the need to transcend, to go beyond the rather crude dichotomy of genes and environment. I doubt that that would have gone back down very well in the Soviet Union either. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I have ended up in a camp like Ravilov, but anyhow, I don't think either of us would survive too long. I think, I think you'd have been shot first and me slightly later, probably, Stephen. <laughs> that depends on I how prepared you are. <laughs> <laughs> There's a popular catchphrase, genes for this and genes for that, and, and what's your feeling about that kind of language? I think it's a mystification of the way that the genes actually work. There aren't genes for anything in that particular sense, um, in terms of a whole organism. Um, any one gene, any one bit of DNA is pleiotropic, that is, it has multiple effects in multiple systems, and any aspect of the way that we are, from the colour of our eyes to the way that we behave, is the result of a very complex interplay of, of many, many genes with the environment during all of our development. That's why I insist on development. If you think in terms of, the, of a human with our 23,000 genes, with our 100,000 proteins, with our 100 trillion different cells in the body, with all the um, extraordinary combination of possibilities of connections between different cells in the brain, it's quite clear that genes don't in that sense code for any aspect of the phenotype as individuals. What they do is contribute to the development of the individual, and that's yes. the way it has to be understood. Of course, I mean, of course, what geneticists actually study is variation, and they, as it were, statistically wipe out all that complexity by saying that despite all the complexity, this population of people has blue eyes and that population has brown eyes or whatever it might be. And the difference between this population and that population can really be a single gene difference. And that actually is what geneticists do. In Mendel's peas, the curly peas and the smooth peas, of course there were hundreds of genes operating yeah. on those peas, but uh, the uh, difference between these and those was just one gene. Of course, except that um, I would correct you in one sense, and that is it is not between one population and another. The whole way in which you can uh, study variation is within a... Um, I didn't mean meaningful. population, I meant in the statistical sense, this, yes. this group of okay. peas and that group of okay. peas. Okay, so if we want to know why the colour of your eyes differs from the colour of my eyes, um, as it does slightly, yeah, yeah. I think, actually. Um, then you might look at differences in our genes, which would be one reason why it would be there. And certainly there are single gene differences which will account for differences between blue and brown eyes. But to construct a blue eye rather than constructing a brown eye, requires um, a very large number of Absolutely. different genes. Absolutely, no question. Yeah. And that's, I think, where the mystification yeah. actually arises. So um, it's a difference between understanding the, the reasons for variations and understanding the reasons for causes in those variations. Yeah. We don't disagree about that. I mean, back to the antelope again. Yeah. Um, uh, 
it, it could very well be that the, the reason why one antelope runs faster than another is a single gene. It probably isn't. But no matter that, the number of genes that go to make antelope muscles and bones and ligaments and things yeah. is very, very large yeah. uh, and interacting. Yeah. Nevertheless, it and is no, no, the certainly possible why that a single may, gene difference could The reason why it. one antelope may run faster than another um, is only relevant in the context of a particular gene in a particular context. And if you ignore the context, you speak about genes for, and that's where gene talk becomes so, I think, sort of so, so problematic. Not just in the general culture, but in, uh, even amongst sort of biologists themselves. And there's a huge difference, I think, between you and I um, in terms of our respective formations as biologists, because you start as a zoologist and as, as an evolutionary theorist. I start as a, as, as a biochemist. Yeah. And, the, and you can see that very clearly in the way that your genes in your own writing become sort of theoretical genes. I mean, you talk somewhere about the possibility of having genes for bad teeth, which can actually sort of, you know, and, and that's, that's a, if you like, it's a, it's a metaphysical construct. Whereas if you're dealing as the way that, um, that I do in the lab, with real sticky-fingered biology, with real differences between one organism and another, and look at the genes and the proteins that are involved in that, you have a very different perspective on the way the role that genes play, not just in the life of the organism, but in the, de in, in, in the transition between one generation and another. So this is, I think, why biologists talk in different sorts of ways, and where you've, in a sense, um, fallen into computer models and abstractions in a way that I don't think that if you'd stayed in the lab, you'd have been able to do No, that's that. probably right. But, I I mean, the difference is a very, very powerful thing. I mean, oh, you yes. couldn't do genetics unless you... Unless you well, that's the problem with the whole cent century and a half's history of genetics. And it really became a, a, a crisis at the beginning of the last century when genetics and development went in two separate ways. So developmental biologists asked what's the cause of similarities, geneticists asked what's the cause of difference. Exactly. Now, yeah. one of the very good things that's happening now is that genes are disappearing. Um, you know, the gene, in a sense, is a figment of the imagination. What matters, for mole as, as molecular biologists would say, is the entire genome in context. Um, and that's why, um, for example, a rather well-known book has been written, which is called The Century of the Gene, which ends up with the, with the argument genes are now disappearing. Gene talk has become part of popular culture. DNA has become part of popular culture, just as their significance is disappearing from the whole of biology itself. Well, Stephen, why can't you just say embryology and genetics are both important? And they're not competing they're, but, with each other. Of course they're, they're both. They shouldn't compete. That's why, that's why um, we should, both of us, embrace this new discipline, which is called, which is called the terrible name of Evo Devo. Evo Devo. Well, yes, why not? I'm perfectly happy with that. But you, you can't wipe out the whole of genetics. I mean, I'm Mendel not, did no, no. very good science. Mendel and, did and very good science, but to teach genetics as if, in fact, the important thing is the difference between yellow and green peas, rather than the important thing is similarities and yellow and green peas, if you like. And a, a relative exception to the complexity of the way in which genes work is to mystify generations of, of, of medical students and, um, and, and, and biology students. Well, what, as a very famous editorial in Nature pointed out a little time back. OK, and why don't you just go back to my blanket and accept that the blanket is influenced by hundreds of genes, but the difference between that set of blankets, which does that, yeah. and that set of blankets that does that, yeah. could actually be a single gene, and it, it could be could, very important. It could be a single gene, it could be, but it's only important in a single gene in context. And what I'm trying to get you to put in the whole time is the context. Look, there are two things that are going on here. We, you and I are having a conversation. You can either focus on you and I having the conversation, or you can focus on the entire context in which this conversation is going on, which include television cameras, the people in the Taliban hall, the hum behind it, and so on. And all of those help shape the way in which this conversation is actually happening. And single gene differences between you and I are part of that, but they're not all of that. Well, that's I agree they're not all that. That's, that, that, that's the direction I want you to go in. And I want you to go into it because... because uh, Partly, and it is, as I keep saying, in a complimentary sort of way, your fault because of writing very well, and partly because I don't think you've clarified this in things that have gone on subsequently, gene, simple-minded gene talk, simple-minded gene talk of the way that it, it, it has actually permeated our culture in a way which I think is um, socially and in some ways politically pernicious. Um, and, but at the same time, it paints you into a very extraordinary philosophical position. Um, at the end of the first edition of The Selfish Gene... Oh, I know what's you, coming now. You, okay. know what's coming now. <laughs> okay. you have this very famous phrase, yeah. actually, sort of when you're talking about um, the, the, the genes as, 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 as replicators and us as robots, you say, only we can escape the tyranny of our selfish genes. 
Now, I say that puts you into an extraordinarily dualistic position. I mean, who is this we? Oxford boy, well, it who's actually, who's a, who, who is this we that can suddenly escape our genes? If our genes do all of this, then how can we escape them? Now, my position is that it's be precisely because we are genes in organisms, and it's, it's, it's the genetic result of evolution, if you like, which has produced humans who are indeed able, as a result of their genes, to actually sort of make the very different worlds in which we live. So it's not our genes, it's not we have to escape our genes, we should thank our genes for giving us the possibility of actually, being able to change so our exactly lives. exactly my position, I don't know how, how we ever managed to disagree. Um, I mean, we, of course we, we rebel against the selfish genes every time we use a contraceptive. Uh, I mean, obviously natural selection isn't going uh, to Hang on, but, but who is the we? I mean, you are. It's you the are brain. Down. It's the it's the the big brains. It's the it's the psychology. It's the yeah. But the are, brains aren't somehow separate from our genes. No, the brains have they're produced by 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 evolution under the influence of natural selection. That's why we've got big brains because yes. of natural selection. Yes, yes, it's a very um, good reason. For good and brains, our big isn't? brains have have taken off and gone beyond the tyranny of the selfish genes, and we now rebel against them by using contraceptives, by wasting our time doing philosophy and, and mathematics and science instead of just getting on with procreating, all sorts of ways in which we obviously do. So we do. have genes which enable us to rebel against genes? Indirectly, as you yep. were so fond of saying, by the complexity of embryology, yep. they produce big brains, and it's the big brains that are, that are rebelling, but the big brains themselves are the product of natural selection of genes, yes. Of course they're the product of natural selection, and therefore that we are the product of natural selection. And you're, you're, as it were, sort of somehow cutting yourself loose from that, I think produces you in what, um, in philosophical terms, we regard as a classical dualist position, <laughs> in which you have somewhere the free will to do something which isn't the, shaped the by our biology The implication and our of that would be that only a dualist can use a contraceptive, and it's... it's, it's <coughs> I like that, but I don't think it's quite true because we're none of us entirely consistent in our behaviour. Well, okay. <laughs> but but it, I mean, coming back to the, the the gene talk thing, the moment you talk about um, genes for intelligence, the moment you talk as if intelligence wasn't immensely complicated, in which genes, of course, have a part to play. After all, part of intelligent behaviour involves um, using eyesight using sense organs, and genetic variation which can diminish our eyesight actually is going to diminish our intelligence in that sort of sense, and equally around. To argue that you can actually take genes out of that uh, context doesn't make any sense at all, but to talk about genes for intelligence or genes for IQ is the sort of talk which is problematic. Now also, where I think it becomes very problematic, um, and I'd be interested to know in your position on this, is in the way that evolutionary psychology has, 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 has taken off. Now, um, of course, our psychology is an evolved psychology, but the idea of evolutionary psychology has been hijacked, in my view, by a group of um, non-biologists, primarily, um, who insist that human nature, whatever they mean by that, was fixed in the Pleistocene 160,000 years ago, and nothing can change since. So we are, have built into the ways in which we behave now, what our nature is now, things which were fixed that time ago, and this is what they would then argue was the core of issues about aggression, issues about racism, issues about sort of differences in intelligence, issues about sort of innate differences between men and women. And I think that has become a very dangerous way of talking and a way of talking which is actually um, also not in accord with the way that, um, that, that evolution occurs or that biology occurs. Mm. I think that may be a bit unfair, but... but uh let, let me put it to you in the form of a, of a question. Would you agree with me that if we were di some sort of malevolent dictator, we could artificially select humans over a period of centuries for some kind of mental ability? I mean, musical ability, mathematical ability, uh, for um, the ability to solve particular puzzles, that kind of thing. Insofar as artificial selection, in Darwin's term, were to produce pouter pigeons and fantails and, uh, and, and so on, and if you knew the character quotes that you were selecting for, and I'm not sure whether musical ability represents a character in that sense, then um, artificial selection over okay. generations would actually produce yeah. certain sorts of changes. I mean, we, suppose we didn't uh, know but, what, yeah, but, okay. but 
um, artificial selection is always going to take place in the context of the environment, which will inevitably dictate you would have to keep constant over that period of time in order to do it, which is exactly the way that plant and animal breeders go about it. So, so just as breeding cattle or something of the sort, yes. we wouldn't actually have to know the genetics of musical ability. You could simply, uh, in each generation, uh, give people and an test for musical. I don't know, some kind of musical test would be e easily done, and breed from them, I mean, m mate male musicians with female musicians. Well, um, I'm, I, I'd be out of the window to start with. I don't know how you <laughs> well, would So would Darwin. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so indeed would Darwin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but so we don't, we don't disagree that there's got to be a genetic basis for that variation in human there ability, has, psychological there ability. Has, there has got, we absolutely agree that it is possible to select in the given environment for certain sorts of traits in individuals, um, and that has to be the case, but the, it, again, the emphasis is on selecting for that trait in that environment. And let me give you um, a, 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 a genuine counterexample, which comes out of um, selection in neuroscience. There was an attempt for many, many years to select for high intelligence in different strains of rats, yeah. which were bred over um, many tens, even hundreds of generations. And you selected them for the intelligent behavior of being able to run fast in a particular sort of maze. It then turned out that if you actually test them in a different sort of task, then the, quotes high intelligence strain of rats is no better than, yeah. in some ways, worse than the other. And that says that everything depends precisely on the context in which you understand the selection for and keeping that particular environment in that test context. So I don't know if selecting someone who is actually very good as a, a, a trombone player would actually right. make them a good No, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, I, I often use that line of argument when people ask me, as they almost always do, about um, the uh, Darwinian advantage of, I mean, why are there gay people? Yeah. And, and one of the things I say is that maybe if there is genetic variation that influences sexual preference, maybe in the Pleistocene it did something quite different. So what we're talking about is if we're going to use the langu language of a gene for X, in those days it was a gene for something quite different because the environment has changed. For example, we switched from breastfeeding to bottle feeding or something. It's now no longer a gene for whatever it was then. It's now become a gene for being gay. Um, using it in the sense of a gene that influences variation. So that should be a cautionary tale, just like your rat cautionary tale. There is no such thing as a gene for X, only a gene for X in this environmental context. Well, that's right, but it, the, 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 the example is a very interesting one in a variety of ways. Firstly, because what you've done is presented um, hypothetically what we've always called as just-so stories, that maybe there was that particular yeah. thing in the Pleistocene. I mean, we know damn all about the way humans were yeah. in the Pleistocene, because we've got is a few shards of bones and pots, and, uh, s s and skeletons that may or may not be um, sort of a, 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 a young female hominid, or a slightly deformed sort of um, male hominid. And on that, this great edifice of speculation is built. But there's another issue which is floated around there, and that is the concept of being gay is itself a concept which is socially, culturally bound. Being, um, having male homosexuals practices in Greek society, for example, um, was, at, at least amongst the non-slave slave classes in Greek society, was very different from being Oscar Wilde or being um, a, 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 a male homosexual gay in Victorian England, or what it is now. These things are incredibly culturally bound. So even the concept of gay doesn't mean anything except in the social context in which it actually appears, which is why it's it is comparable to the concept of intelligence in my rat example. Well, yes, I mean, I think that's another point in... It, it, no, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the moment we come to consider things um, in the rich complexity of the real world, it becomes a crucial thing, and that's why, to come back to your artificial selection issue, um, the ways in which um, fantails or powder pigeons, I'm going back to Darwin's examples of the pigeons all the time, or the way in which one's attempted to breed for high-yielding crop, high crop strains in the incredibly detailed and slow work that's gone on in, um, in crop selection over the decades has been incredibly sort of context-bound. And the way in which you get sort of um, green revolution crops, which are supposed to be high-yield crops, being introduced in the wrong context, in a different context in, 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 the, in the third world, produces consequences which are quite unplanned for in the way that those crops were actually developed. So context is all. Um, and you keep saying, quite rightly, you agree with me, because fundamentally, 
we're not going to be agreed about this, but you are looking at things from the other end of the telescope from the way that I'm looking at them. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think it's important, if we're going to do natural selection at all, yeah. to recognise that natural selection has got to have genetic variation to work on. That goes without saying. And in the context in which it, in which it works, in the era in, in which it works, yeah. the reason why animals that had this kind of gene survived better than those that had that kind of gene was because they produced different phenotypes. Something emerged from the wash of all that complexity yeah. such that this lot of animals ran faster or had sharper yeah. teeth, whatever it was, than, thi than this lot of animals. And we uh, don't want to it, lose uh, sight uh, of that in the face of no, all this complexity. No, we don't want to lose sight of it. But what we also need then to remember as well is that the existence of animals, the antelopes with sharper teeth or with uh, or which run faster, actually does other things to the environment. It may produce overgrazing in a particular area. It produces a, as, as you and John Krebs wrote all that time ago, an arms race in which, um, in, in, in which you then have to have complementary changes in the, in the lion in order to catch the faster running antelopes. Yeah. Um, and that's why, and I'd like to press you on this, that's why my understanding of evolutionary change and my understanding of, of, of what biology is telling us is that because of the ways in which, the, in which organismic changes um, change environments in unpredictable ways, and these in turn feed back in changing the pressures on natural selection and so on, the future becomes radically indeterminate. Yeah. And that is a very important, I think, sort of thing for, for all of us as biologists to emphasize. Would, yes. you, would you be happy I, with that? I, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, we, we, looking back in time, the, the coming of oxygen into the world was a huge biologically wrought yes. change in the environment. And then all kinds of things yeah. uh, followed on from yeah. that. And, and we're in grave danger of producing uh, just such well, indeed, when we, when we come back to climate change. And some things are produced by the organisms themselves. As we, as a human populations, are producing the climate change. Some things happen from outside. I mean, I don't know whether we now believe or not that the um, meteor impact um, all those um, millions of years ago was responsible for wiping out the dinosaurs and producing a different environment in which mammals could flourish. But it's clear that external events, which cannot be predicted by, if you like, evolute by genetics are also going to change the way in which the environment works and selection no question, yeah. and in that sense and this is again I think a very important biological lesson which I hope we would agree on is that evolutionary change can only track the environment the, the, the environment it can't actually predict the way that it's going to go ahead so you adapt to the present contingencies all the time and yet your adaptation to those contingencies change the context in which they will be expressed subsequently. Yes. Um, so it, we're, we're, we're never in the world of prediction, Well, even in genetic Maybe, terms. no, um, with, with a slight reservation. Uh, when evolution is tracking the inanimate climate, ice ages and droughts yeah. and things, that you're absolutely spot on. I think arms races slightly change the picture because arms races pro pro produce just a little bit of predictability mm -hmm. in that you sort of can predict that your enemies are going to get better at being enemies because you're getting better at being their enemy and so there will be a tendency for predators to run faster and prey to run faster. Yes, but that gives you only a two-body problem. You can't actually sort of look at the impact of that on the whole of the rest of the ecosystem in which both predators and prey are. It is a two-body problem. I suspect it's generalizable. Uh, one thing that makes me think that is that if you look at, we've got quite a number of natural experiments. I mean, the, the mammal-like reptiles, then the dinosaurs, yeah. and then at least five different radiations of mammals in different parts of the world, which produced not identical, but pretty similar mm -hmm. ranges of ecotypes yeah. um, in, in a kind of predictable way. I mean, if, if you said, looking at the rest of the world, let's yeah. now go to Australia, nobody's yeah. ever been to Australia, yeah. predict what we'll find there. Yeah. Uh, we'd have done a pretty good job of predicting yeah. it. I mean, I think the other thing that you could, as it were, retrospectively predict is the moment you have an evolutionary line which um, leads to, which is in, in, involved brains, then brains are going to get bigger and bigger. Right. Because then, as it were, what leads to that sort of evolution success is enhanced smartness. Yes. Until we get over smart, which some people would say that we were yeah. as humans now. And there's something about smartness that feeds on itself and you get into a, a, a self-reinforcing uh, so loop. So, so once you're in, I mean, whatever were the contingencies which actually sort of produce nervous systems and then sort of nervous systems um, sort of which were concentrated in frontal ganglia and then turned into brains was actually inevitably going to, in on that line, actually sort of enhance the development yeah, of the brain. A, that's a very interesting point. Um, that's right. On the other hand, 
the assumption that the brains are the most successful way to go in the world. Oh, that's another matter, matter entirely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. On the question of evolutionary psychology, I, I think you're right that it's, it's perhaps been a bit overdone. But let, let's, let me try and sort of put the case as, as best I can. Agreeing with you that you can't actually say that what goes on in the Pleistocene is immediately relevant to today. Isn't it plausible that there could be some adaptations from the Pleistocene, for example, differences between males and females, which still do uh, have importance, even in the vastly different yeah. cultural circumstances we find ourselves in today? Yes, of course. I mean, let's be clear about what we know. And that is that we are an evolved species. We have, if you like, the psychology that we have because we are a social organism, because our um, infants are born near tennis. They have to have about seven, many years of, of parental care before they're fit to exist independently in the world. Because we are all roughly between sort of one and a half and two and a half meters tall, because we live for about 70, 80, 90 years, because we see in particular wavelengths. The societies that we construct are shaped in that sense by who we are as evolved organisms and in that sense our evolved psychology. It's when you come to look at the more specific claims which are made by um, that particular brand of evolutionary psychology that I think you run into trouble. And you run into trouble both in terms of biological understanding and much more seriously in a sense for the outside world is the political and social implications of what those claims are. Um, because if we are talking about differences in, the, in sex differences between uh, males and females, yes, of course, they are there. They're there in the chromosomes, they're there in the genes, they're there in the ways that sort of brains and bodies develop and so on. And they will shape the way in which um, men and women behave in the world. The fact that women lactate and men do not lactate um, ship, says something about the burden of who's going to do childcare in particular sort of, sorts of ways. But we also know that these forms have been almost infinitely flexible in the different sorts of societies that have created. And what our psychology has given us, if you like, what our evolution has given us, is the capacity to create many different societies in many different forms. And what I object to about evolutionary psychology um, is that they look, if you like, at the particular lifestyle of what I would say was Californian bourgeois um, middle-class people in the 1950s and 1960s, project it back into the Pleistocene and say men and women have to have lived in, in this sort of way in California there, now, um, and that's therefore because they must have been adapted for that in the Pleistocene. That's what I call Flintstone psychology. Yeah. And that seems to me to the problem. We don't know the answers to those questions. What we do know is that even in your and my lifetime, we've seen huge differences in the relationships between men and women, huge differences in the way that we relate to others as, as, as sexual partners, as lovers, um, in society itself. And those differences are all, if you like, entailed or made possible by our genes. But are, none of those differences are actually fixed in the ways that we actually behave. Um, so, if you look at what are the relatively trivial differences that are picked up in the sort of standard psychology tests between the way that um, uh, men and women do maths or which bits of the brain that you use. Um, we did an experiment of, uh, two or three years ago looking at um, supermarket choices and imaging brain processes in the people making supermarket choices. And we looked at differences between men and women. Um, and sure enough, the men and the women, different bits of their brain lit up on average between this group of males and this group of females um, while they were making supermarket choices. But the amount of time that they took and the choices that they made were not actually so sort of distinguishable at all. Yeah. The outcomes were the same. Yes. So biological differences don't necessarily project onto social differences or behavioural differences. Yeah. In what I really object to is people making decisions on the basis of supposed differences. And like, you know, we, we need a woman to do this job because women are better at doing this and we need a man to do this job. I mean, that's what I really object to. I want people to be given jobs on the basis of their abilities. And if it so happens that men are more likely to get one kind of job or women another, that's fine. But yeah, I but fear we'd that... All, we'd all like that, but we also know that we live in a profoundly sexist society in which it is taken for granted um, that the overwhelming number of conversations of this sort will be made between two, two um, alpha or ex-alpha males. Um, and if you look down at the PAs and the research assistants in a television crew which is making it, they are, in my experience, more likely to be women than men. And we do know that that's the shape of the society in which we're living at the moment. And that is a shape that is actually, if you like, blessed by the claims of evolutionary psychology. Well... <laughs>
I mean, I think you, that, that if, you, if you nail your colours to the mast of there aren't any differences, then that's, you're a hostage to fortune. That's not what I'm doing. No, but what, no. I'm, what I'm nailing my colours to the mast, uh, to, to the mast of saying, is that differences emerge as a result not just of genes, but of complexity and of history and okay. society and culture. And it is almost impossible to disentangle these in any real life situation. Um, it's just about possible in the confined context of a laboratory. Now, I've spent 40 years as a researcher trying to understand the differences that go on um, when day-old chicks learn a very simple task and the different processes that go on involved in that particular task, whether it's attention, arousal, visual perception, memory, all these individual processes. Trying to unpick those, even in an extremely restricted laboratory context, was actually incredibly complicated and difficult. And I wouldn't have said that we'd done it after 40 years. We found an awful lot of very interesting things. And that's when I object to the ways in which these very simplistic assumptions are then projected onto the complexity of society. Okay, but you wouldn't wish to retreat behind complexity all the time. I mean, there's going to be science I don't retreat does advance by complexity. By... I actually rejoice in complexity. The difficulty we've got, all of us have got as laboratory scientists, or even as it were as model-making scientists, is that we can't deal with complexity. So we actually abstract from it. Um, my chick in a pen pecking at a bead. Your theoretical construct of a gene for bad teeth, and so on. We make models based on it, and we do experiments based on it. Um, and if the models are good or the experiments are good, you may find your way to Stockholm. But it doesn't mean that that's actually sort of what the real, what's going on in real life. You use the word pernicious when talking about, I think, an aspect of evolutionary psychology. Can you sort of elaborate on that a bit? Well, it's pernicious because it is, provides, if you like, a social justification for illiberal and unjust um, policies. It provides, if you like, a statement that this is the way the world is. It's the, it's the weary... Um, law-giving biologist or psychologist who says, well, we might want to think of a better world, but this is the best of all possible worlds, so live with it. If you actually don't believe that this is the best of all possible worlds, if you believe that it's possible to actually change the world, to be confronted with this illegitimate biological inevitability is a weapon in the hands of, I would have said, sort of, um, those conservatives who are very happy with the status quo, who like a class-written, sexist and racist society, because they want to claim the justification for it. And it's no surprise, if you like, that um, claims on the basis of sociobiology or evolutionary psychology or claims about intelligence find their way instantly onto the websites of the British National Party. Yeah. You, you yourself have been on those websites of the BNP or the, its, its predecessors. When Jim Watson came to London and made a remark about differences in intelligence between Africans and, and whites, which he instantly retracted after he'd been shot at enough by, 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 by a variety of scientists who said this wouldn't stand, his statement was instantly on the website of the British National Party. Now that's why it becomes outside this discourse and into the discourse yeah. of politics yeah. in general. That's yeah. why it's so serious. Yeah. It is pernicious as long as people think that what biology says is ought to be, and we know that's not the case. I mean, well, wh you're, why you're don't we just say, say, to hell with what biology... I mean, Stephen Pinker said, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to have children. If my selfish genes disagree, they, my selfish genes can go and jump in the lake. I know Stephen says that, and that's why, he's a, uh, that's why I accuse him of being just the same sort of so dualist as me. I realise, yeah, yeah. As, as, as you are. I, I pleased to say that I found myself in the, in, in, in the company of a large number of philosophers of science, of science who are making the same charge at the particular moment. This is a sort of materialism which degenerates into dualism because you paint yourself into a corner. And I would want to argue that I was a thoroughly materialist who actually wouldn't accept that and actually want to rejoice in the fact that we are the products of our genes of evolution, of culture and society. And that is the complexity that makes you and I what well, we are. See, I think and the complexity which makes you and I different from what we are lies in our genes, lies in um, your background in, um, as I believe, the child of, 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 what was it, sort of mission with someone? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> so, Another so, of these myths that church people have been putting about. Well, no I'm, truth I'm, in I'm, it, whatever. I'm, I'm glad you could actually scotch that yes. particular yes. myth now. But we do have different pasts and different formations yeah. of scientists and different formations as individuals, um, even though we're both products of, um, of, of a particular English and relatively privileged educational system. And those differences help make us what we are. Yeah, but, but it's you that's being the dualist. I, I can't <laughs> know who got back to that. <laughs>
there really is no problem about saying that on the one hand I am the product of natural selection of genes and on the other hand saying that if my genes don't like what I do I, they can go and jump in the lake which is what Stephen Pinker said. That's not dualism because what he believes and what I believe and what you believe is that it's our brains that give us the power to do what we like and, and it's, there, there's no I mean, if you're a, a thoroughgoing determinist of any sort, you may have problems with that. But adding the word genetic isn't going to make any difference. We don't have to be genetic determinists. We can, be, um, we can believe in free will, we can believe in determinism, and that's all a philosophical discussion to which we don't have to bring genes in at all. Genes don't add to the determinism of determinism. Do you, well, yeah, but we've agreed on a number of things. We agreed, firstly, that the future is radically indeterminate. So believing in determinism is actually sort of... Well, the, well very hard to predict, anyway. Hard yeah. to predict? Yeah. All right, well, before, before you nodded when I said radically yeah. indeterminate, okay. so I won't hold you to it if you want to shift okay. back from that. But my problem is still, who is the we in this particular... The, the, the we, the person, when you use the word I, our brains enable us to do this. We are people. And as people, we are constructed by, um, by our evolutionary history, by our, by our bi biosocial existence. And it's that the materialism of being part of a biosocial existence, which I think is so important. The statement of we is suggesting that you are autonomous from your genes, that because you've got a big brain, um, I would say because actually sort of you are a person sort of constructed, which involves both your brains, your genes, and your, and, and your social context. Um, is precisely what trips into that sort of dualism. Yeah, but why should I disagree with that? I, 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 uh, because, we, because you claim to be, I believe, a materialist. And your materialist, well, so do you, so do yes, you. Yes, but your materialism has put you into a position where actually you have to have this we separately from it. And that we has been cut loose from the materialism of the world. I mean, it exists as some sort of superstructure, sort of way up there. I mean, you say it's in here. You might say it's between here and here. But um, it doesn't make any sense to talk about we outside our biosocial person. Well, I think that's right. But I mean, I, I don't. I think that everything you've said applies to both of us equally. Okay. And 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 I don't see why my talking about natural selection of genes makes any difference to that. It doesn't make any difference to that. It only makes a difference to your statement that we can rebel against the tyranny of our selfish genes, or in Stephen Sapinka's case, that his genes can go drunk, it, go jump in the lake. That's because he does it in North American Demotic, in Judaism, Oxford, English. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't make the position any clearer. Well, I, I don't think there's any distinction between your kind of materialism and, and his, his and mine. We, we, we ain't going to solve this now, no, I aren't. think, okay. Richard. Okay. I, th I think there's a profound and very interesting one, but we'll pursue it at another time. All right. Thank you very much indeed.